So today we are going to take a look at Aurora Cannabis, ticker symbol ACB.TO, and we're going to try and answer a few questions. First, what is the true value of Aurora today? Second, is Aurora a buy at current prices? And third, what should you do if you own Aurora stock right now? I promise you that this video will be well worth your time, especially if you're an Aurora shareholder. I'll give you a quick one minute summary right now to highlight some of the important things we cover in the video. The risk of investing in the cannabis industry right now is extremely troubling. This means that we need a strong equity risk premium to consider entering a space where asset sales and equity dilution are certainties rather than possibilities. In this environment, Aurora is overlevered, leading to the possibility for insolvency if the company is unable to source equity. Overall, the company appears to be destroying shareholder wealth with ROE and ROIC ratios significantly below the company's cost of capital. After doing a net asset value and discounted cash flow analysis, it seems that it is not an attractive time to be an Aurora shareholder, nor is it a good time to buy the stock. Recommended actions are discussed at the end of the video if you are currently holding the stock. We'll start the analysis by using some screens. These screens should help us determine if Aurora is currently out of favor in the market and in an obscure industry. If a stock meets these screening requirements, this is typically the best time to buy a stock. It makes sense logically if people oversell the stock because of some bad news or not many analysts are looking at it, then its price is more likely to stray from its true intrinsic value. As you can see, in this case, Aurora passes only one out of four screens, signifying that it likely isn't undervalued. Next, we should consider if the company has a high probability of sustaining a competitive advantage over its peers. If we find this probability to be low, then we should stop our analysis here. I believe the company has a very low probability of sustaining its competitive advantages, if it even has any material advantages. However, there are a lot of retail investors who own Aurora, so I want to cover the challenges I see this industry and business going through in the coming months or years to help my fellow investors. Next, we want to analyze the industry and determine the risk of holding Aurora stock in this environment. One of the main issues plaguing the space right now is that projected revenues for the legalized cannabis market have not materialized and the black market remains strong. This leads to the next two issues. As these graphs on your screen are showing, companies have been racing to ready their supply chains for the expected growth in the cannabis market, but that growth has never come. However, there is a key issue that has come with this. The top seven producers alone have far more cannabis produced than they can actually use at current sales levels. Now, if sales levels were growing significantly, this wouldn't be an issue. But as we can see, sales growth has been slow to materialize, creating heavy oversupply, which has led to the next issue. Oversupply has led to limited producers, also known as LPs, competing on price. This price compression has contributed to the commoditization of the market, which we will discuss in greater detail later. The chart on your screen now is the selling price per gram that Aurora sees in the consumer space, and it's clear to see that the consumer is demanding lower prices. Because there are so many competitors and an oversupply of cannabis, prices are falling sharply. This trend is likely to continue given that a cheaper alternative in the black market is always available and the cash cost to produce a gram of cannabis is also very low. However, the main reason this issue is likely to continue is because of the next challenge impacting the market. The Ontario and British Columbia provincial governments have been slow to roll out stores, which has resulted in many consumers sticking with their black market suppliers. In addition to this, when you are a business selling simple products, the way you increase your market share is by trying to diversify your product through branding and marketing. However, the Canadian government has put in place strict restrictions on the packaging and other marketing efforts used by companies. To imagine how harmful this is, imagine Coke and Pepsi were not able to engage in marketing efforts when they first started competing against each other. This has caused the different brands to blend together in the consumer's eyes, further commoditizing the industry. 
This lack of branding creates bigger issues for the companies if they want to expand into other countries. Why would a US consumer be willing to pay for a likely higher priced Canadian good with a weaker brand image than local competitors? Well, the truth is they likely wouldn't be, and this causes issues for the long-term outlook of the Canadian LPs and their consumer-facing brands. However, it's not all negative for the LPs, and there are some positives for these cannabis companies. The legalization of cannabis 2.0 products is expected to be more popular with the older demographics who are hesitant to try smoking cannabis but are used to consuming other substances through food or drink varieties. There is some promising data that suggests that people who had reserves about smoking cannabis will be willing to try it in another form. Further, it is estimated that cannabis 2.0 products will fetch higher selling prices and in turn higher gross margins. This should help some well-managed cannabis companies with their efforts to achieve profitability. Now we just need to summarize all these factors in a table and determine the overall business risk of holding Aurora stock right now. From an industry perspective, this is a very risky industry to be investing in right now, given these intense competitive dynamics, negative regulatory factors, and the instability of cash flows impacting most incumbents. Further, the market dynamics do not look good for the industry or Aurora right now, as consumer confidence is very low and unemployment levels are at record highs. However, cannabis companies have never been tested in a real recession environment. So we could actually see these companies benefit from this environment like sin stocks do. To understand the risk of Aurora relative to other incumbents, we must first consider some additional factors. From a size perspective, Aurora fares well as the third largest player in terms of revenue. However, their margins are weak and this has led to a very poor financial track record. The company has a history of overpaying for things and borrowing from the future to pay for capacity. This is finally catching up with the company, and after looking at some assumptions the management team is using in their financial reports, I believe this will continue. Finally, we want to determine if Aurora has a strong competitive position relative to its peers. To evaluate this, I wanted to determine the popularity of Aurora's products relative to other competitors on the Ontario Cannabis Store. In this case, I found that Aurora is a major competitor in the dried flower space, and holds about 50% of the best sellers in this category. Given the importance of this section in the market, I believe this gives them a competitive edge if they have a product that's popular with consumers. However, the real test will be to see if Aurora can maintain this popularity with consumers with their Cannabis 2.0 products. Overall, based on this analysis, we should expect to see management hope to hold debt levels at about 10 to 29% of the overall capital structure. This is because the industry is definitely high business risk and you don't want the company holding significant debt levels and creating additional financial risk. The next step is to determine if there is significant financial risk in holding Aurora stock. Based on the book values of equity method, it seems that Aurora is operating within its optimal debt levels, which would indicate that the company has medium financial risk and management is actually being effective here. However, we often want to look at the market values of equity because book values can be slow to react to changes in the industry or environment. Here we see that the current debt to equity levels are extremely unsustainable and the company is holding far too much debt. This would mean that the company will likely experience financial distress and the company will see significant dilution if it needs to issue new equity. For these reasons, if we are going to hold the stock, we should expect to be fairly compensated for these risks, which means we will want a higher equity risk premium. We always want to be checking that our numerical analysis is painting an accurate picture of what's happening to the stock right now. In this case, Aurora is facing a lot of liquidity risk and is diluting its shareholder base very heavily, so our analysis seems to be painting an accurate picture of what's currently happening to the stock in the market.
Based on this prior analysis, we can now determine the weighted average cost of capital, or WAC, of Aurora. There are multiple ways of determining a WAC of a company. First, we can use the table shown before to determine the cost of equity through using the equity risk premium. Then, we can use the average of the book value and market value weights of debt to calculate the WAC. This results in a WAC of roughly 15%. The other method of calculating the WAC is by using the CAPM method to calculate the cost of equity. I also use some traditional finance elements in here, like using net debt rather than overall debt, uh, using the market weights rather than the average, and here we see that the WAC is actually lower and at approximately 13%, so not in two different worlds. However, I will move forward using the WAC of 15% as I believe the second method misses the cost of financial distress as it uses beta, which I believe is a flawed measure of risk in this instance. Now we get to arguably the most important test. Is the company generating returns on the invested capital above its cost of capital? Essentially, is Aurora's ROIC greater than its WAC? There are two methods of calculating ROIC shown on the screen. Here we see that it's clear that Aurora is destroying shareholder wealth through its current operations. Based on this, we should expect to see in further analysis that Aurora's net asset value is likely higher than its earnings power value. A simple way to say this is that the current management team is not utilizing the assets to generate sufficient returns for shareholders. Further, since the ROIC is actually negative, management will likely need to source additional capital, leading to further dilution of current shareholders and further wealth destruction. After doing this analysis, I always like to do a decomposed ROE analysis to determine where the major problem areas are. So here we see the main issues are the asset turnover and the net profit margins. A low asset turnover indicates that management is not efficiently allocating capital to revenue generating assets. A low or negative profit margin indicates that management is overspending and is not able to derive a return from its efforts. I also wanted to add a note here. Management is actually losing more than two times the money they bring in from revenue, which is just a shocking display of poor management in my opinion. We can see this simply by reading news headlines about the cannabis companies producing more than they are selling and engaging in extremely expensive acquisitions. The next step is to determine what the net asset value of the company is on a per share basis. What you see on your screen here is the first part of the NAV analysis. This tells us the total realizable value of Aurora's assets. We need to make some adjustments to the book values here because accounting can sort of skew these numbers, so we need to adjust them for valuation purposes. We also need to account for some hidden assets, which are the product portfolio and the customer relations figures you see on your screen. These are essentially the accumulation of expenses Aurora has incurred to generate those popular products we saw on the OCS and its customer relationships. A new entrant would have to incur these expenses to be able to compete effectively with Aurora, so we treat them as an asset. Next, we need to look at the liability side of things. After we adjust these numbers, we can determine the net realizable value of the assets. This analysis shows that the overall assets would be able to generate $2.99 of value for each Aurora shareholder after accounting for the liabilities. However, there are a few things to consider. The NAV is not a perfect reflection of the share price. Why? Well, because this would be the value per share if management stopped operating right now and sold off all its assets at the values used here. But can Aurora actually do this right now? I would say no. First, there's an oversupply in the industry, which has driven asset prices way down. Second, the global issue has led to decreased demand for acquiring assets, unless they are deeply, deeply discounted. Third, this NAV analysis includes things like goodwill and intangible assets that will lose 99% of their value if the company breaches a covenant and is facing bankruptcy when they need to sell the assets. 
Finally, if Aurora were to breach a covenant, they would have to hire asset appraisers and a whole bunch of other professionals whose fees would likely cut this value in half. So the true realizable NAV in this current market environment is likely closer to about 60 cents a share. Next, we want to consider what Aurora's earnings power value is. However, we can't do a simple EPV analysis for Aurora due to two reasons. First, Aurora is in a growth stage. Second, they're in financial distress. So managing cash flow and dilution is a real concern we have to worry about. These companies require complex financial models to be built to determine if they will have sufficient cash flows to repay upcoming liabilities. Normally, I would never bother building a complex model for these cases as it's not worth the time and effort. But again, I know there are a lot of retail owners of these shares and I have seen some troubling comments on other videos of people saying that they have already lost too much money to be okay with selling their Aurora stock. The complex model will show the liquidity risks facing Aurora and why I wouldn't advise the holding just because you've already lost a lot methodology. I'll highlight the model on the screen as I speak. Feel free to pause and check the numbers if you'd like. It would be a very, very, very long video if I was to go through the entire model. So I'll just highlight the most important pieces. The first thing we need to do when building this type of model is to go through an equity research report and management's guidance for the past 10 earnings calls or so. I have also been fortunate enough to speak to some high-ranking executives in the cannabis space, so that also drove some of my assumptions. Based on everything I read, heard, and discussed with the executives, I came up with the following assumptions and scenarios. A good model should always have a scenario analysis feature. I believe that we would see further price compression given that there were too many competitors vying for a small market share. I assumed there would be a worst case scenario where Aurora would see prices decline uh, and they would only maintain their market share. I also assumed there would be a better case scenario where they would actually obtain market share but still see prices decline. The base case was really a happy medium between these two options. I also reduced Aurora's factory capacity based on the closures of the Aurora Sun and Aurora Nordic facilities. This was something management spoke about in, uh, in their guidance through earnings calls, um, and the CapEx was actually required to be halted based on a covenant that Aurora agreed to uphold. I also made some simplifying assumptions about the depreciation schedule and the terminal year figures. To determine CapEx and other expense data, I used management's guidance. However, I did add some expenses that I believe management would incur if they wanted to compete effectively in the Cannabis 2.0 space. However, the most important aspect we need to factor in here is the mandatory debt repayments the company has due within the next five years. So here we see that I broke out a schedule based on the debt that they would have to repay in the coming five years. Moving into the scenarios now, this is where the real challenge comes in with growth companies, right? You need to be able to project a lot of different cases because you don't really know where the demand is going to be going. The best you can do is use equity research figures that make sense and add to any assumptions they made with your own estimates, which I did. However, the main thing here is the cannabis 2.0 sales. This is what could potentially be a massive game changer for the industry. Aurora would need to see significant growth here in order to save the company. Moving to the model, I created an insolvency test to test whether Aurora would breach any of their covenants or go above their maximum debt revolver and at the money financing options. And so the assumptions used to drive this particular status quo model pointed to the probable insolvency of Aurora by 2021 based on the current debt structure and covenants. I'll go through and highlight the main problematic areas for Aurora. First, the capacity utilization. This is just horrible usage of capital to have this much excess capacity. This is why I personally stay away from these high growth companies as management cannot keep an eye on the returns on invested capital if they're trying to buy hundreds of millions of dollars worth of real estate and assets within a few years of each other. 
Further, there are hundreds of other companies vying for the same property, which leads to inflated pricing. The second major issue that I had was with the margins of the company. So even after accounting for near 50% growth in revenues, the company's margins are still extremely poor. You know, while there is some improvement based on management's guidance and expected cost cutting efforts, we still see margins slowly worsen over time. These poor margins then of course flow into even poorer returns on equity, which is definitely not a good sign to see if we're thinking about holding Aurora stock. However, the main extremely concerning issue that I had with Aurora was with their debt schedule. So I want to raise and bring attention to Aurora's revolver that they have with BMO Financial Group here. So a few interesting things to note about this revolver is that they have a maximum balance of about 360 million and the facility actually matures on August 29, 2021. It's also the most senior debt on the balance sheet, meaning it has the highest ranking claims on Aurora's assets. So based on the projections I made, not only does Aurora go above this 360 million limit in 2021, but they also have no cash available to pay the debt and the company's not really generating much by way of operating cash flow. So this really means two things for Aurora. Either they're gonna have to recycle the debt or they're gonna to have to issue a lot of shares, which will be extremely dilutive to the current shareholder base. So let's say Aurora is lucky enough to recycle the debt. This would still leave them on the hook for any interest expense or principal payments that are required on a year over year basis. However, based on the projections, what's interesting to see is that Aurora actually needs another about 260 million in cash to fund its operations the next year. So even if we assume they get an extra 200 million when they do recycle this debt, the company will face bankruptcy based on these projections. An added issue is that the company also has convertible debentures that mature in 2024. And given that the company seems to be in no position even at this point to handle the repayment of this debt via cash, and you know the conversion price of the converts at $7 per share is nowhere near what the shares are currently trading for, this will likely result in another early conversion deal. So early conversion deals are things that companies make available to convertible debt holders to sort of avoid paying out cash to these debt holders. They allow them to convert their debt into shares at a discounted price to the market. So let's say Aurora was trading for $1 a share. Management would allow these convertible debentures to exercise their convert at an earlier date than expected at let's say 95 cents per share allowing them to get that five cent per share difference by selling the stock immediately upon conversion into the market. The issue with this conversion or early conversion deal is that it really does dilute shareholders because not only does Aurora have to issue a lot more equity, but they're issuing this equity at discounts to the current market value, which causes additional harm to the current shareholder base. So based on this model, we can then go and determine the free cash flow schedule and the DCF schedule, both of which look absolutely brutal for Aurora. The free cash flow schedule shows that Aurora is unable to generate any free cash flow until considering its terminal values. However, these terminal values are so minuscule that even after considering them into infinity, they really don't help the company. So what's the main reason for this? Well. Aurora has an expensive cost of capital or WAC, so this results in the terminal value not becoming a huge sum when we discount it into infinity or, or try and project cash flows in the terminal years. However, what really doesn't help is that Aurora manages to amass a lot of huge losses in the near term, which really cause the enterprise value to sort of not be moved at all by this present value of the terminal year figures. So I also made models about Aurora issuing debt or issuing equity. Fortunately, it would take far too long to cover all these models in one video. However, to summarize them, basically Aurora is unable to issue debt as they breach too many covenants. So the only model that Aurora really survives is the issuing equity model. 
but they greatly dilute shareholders, effectively erasing any hope for a strong rally in the stock price. So I just wanted to show you why uh, Aurora can't really issue additional debt. And it's mainly because of this covenant. So Aurora signed a new covenant with BMO that says their funded debt to book equity cannot exceed 0.2 to 1. And what we actually find is that if they don't dilute shareholders and also don't try and issue additional debt, they actually get to a breach of this covenant in 2023 or 2024. So this basically points to the fact that Aurora will be diluting shareholders at a significant margin because if they breach this covenant, BMO will likely force them to liquidate assets or will force the company into bankruptcy proceedings. So I'm sure some of you watching, or even most of you, might be holding Aurora stock right now and you might be wondering what you should do. So you have a few options here. First, you can sell your stock now and accept that you've taken a loss. Even the best investors lose money on some investments, so it's nothing to be ashamed or afraid of. If you hate the experience you're going through right now, check out my past two videos where I discuss a few simple ways or tips and tricks to help you never lose money, which is, you know, Warren Buffett and Walter Schloss's most important rule to investing. Second, you can wait and see if Cannabis 2.0 drives sales high enough to allow Aurora to maintain its covenants and repay its liabilities as they come due without significantly diluting shareholders. However, there is risk to this strategy where the institutional investors following the stock will be able to react faster than you to sell if there are any potential issues, leaving you with even greater losses. Third, you can buy puts and sell covered calls if you have a large position to mitigate some of the losses you have experienced. And you can structure this in a way where you pay almost nothing up front. Finally, some investors may be holding some small positions in Aurora, and if that's the case, you might want to consider selling out of the position just because Aurora is going through a pretty large uh, reverse split, and this could wipe out your entire position if you don't hold a significant sum of shares. So I hope this analysis highlighted why the buying the dip mentality can be very dangerous and does not always work. It's very easy for investors to get burned if they blindly buy more shares of something just because it's down from their initial purchase price. Another example here is Boeing that's facing similar liquidity issues, but is in much better financial shape, so likely they won't see as harsh negative consequences. This video took hours upon hours of work, so if you do appreciate the insights, please do leave a like down below as it really does help out the channel. Further, if you do own Aurora and this insight has been helpful, please do share it with others who might own the stock to potentially help them out of a rough situation. Remember to subscribe and let me know if you want to see more videos like this. And also leave a comment down below regarding what you want to see covered in our next deep dive for the channel. I'll also be leaving a poll, so please do subscribe so that you don't miss out on that poll, where you can vote and suggest stocks that should be covered in next month's deep dive analysis. Finally, always remember to be eager to learn, willing to invest, and prepare yourself for success.